I ain't gonna say nobody wasn't next to her because she very well could have felt like somebody was indeed next to her, talking to her. But could nobody else see him? Hey y'all, welcome and or welcome back to my channel. My name is Janae, if you didn't know, and today's video is another true crime episode. So if you're ready, let's go. All right, y'all, so a couple things before we get started. I did my nails last week. And like I said, I did them last week. So as y'all can see, this little piggy here did not survive. And I don't even know if y'all can tell, but there's supposed to be a contrast between the dark brown and the light brown. But the dark brown ain't as dark as I thought it was or as I wanted it to be. And so, yeah, it's not doing what it was supposed to do. But here we are. So, yeah, next time I do something like this, I'm going to make sure that the dark is way darker and the light is a little bit lighter so that we can see the contrast way better. And also, somebody asked me about the wine in a couple of comments. And so this is the wine that I had in the video that she was talking about. If it don't focus, I'm going to just tell y'all what it is. Oh, there it is. So it's the Winemakers Collection Red Blend, and it don't taste that great. And if we're being honest, the only reason that I bought this and the reason that I keep on buying it is because it was cheap and it got 12% alcohol in it. So yeah, we can sacrifice taste a little bit. And today I have a wine from that same brand. It's a white wine, and this one is called Pinot Grigio. And I don't like this one either. I like sweet wine. That's really what I like, but with a lot of alcohol content and cheap. So if y'all know anything like that, let me know. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep buying these $3 and something cent wines. But anyways, other than that, welcome to the holiday season. As y'all can see, we have set up our Christmas decor. And yeah, let's just go ahead and get into today's case. So Jennifer San Marcos was born on December 6, 1961 in Brooklyn, New York to her parents, Frank and Jeanette San Marco. And growing up, Jennifer was described as a social loner. And when I say she was a social loner, I mean that she was she was a likable person. She would engage with the classroom. She would talk to people at school, but she wasn't with a clique. So like she would engage with people at school but she wasn't hanging out outside of school. At some point in her high school career, life got a little bit scary for Jennifer because she was in high school around the time that David Berkowitz started his reign of terror on Brooklyn. And if you don't know who David Berkowitz is, if you've ever heard of The Son of Sam, that is David Berkowitz. And I'm sure there are a lot of videos on YouTube that go into depth about the son of Sam and the whole extent of his crimes. But just know that he was out here wilding out in Brooklyn, killing people. And he started his killings in July of 1976 when Jennifer was just 15 years old. And not only was he in the same city as Jennifer, but she appeared to fit his victim profile. She was a young white girl with long, dark hair. And that seemed to be the type of people who David would target. And so, like I said, I'm pretty sure this was a very, very scary time for her. And I really don't know how she did in school academically, but Jennifer did end up going on to graduate high school and attended college afterwards. However, she wouldn't end up graduating college. She actually decided to move from Brooklyn, New York to Blythe, California. And it was in Blythe that she was able to get a job as a guard in a state prison. And at this job, she was described as a good worker. However, I don't think she liked this job very much because she would quit this job just two days before her probation period was up and this probation period usually at a job is between 30 and 90 days because sometimes I think y'all know what I'm talking about where you start a job but you have this probationary period where they kind of judge your work performance and if you not perform and if you're not performing well within that certain amount of time they either gonna let you go or they're gonna tell you look you need to pick it up and do what you need to do to keep this job or they're gonna let you go. But they didn't have the chance to do that with Jennifer. Jennifer decided that she didn't like the job before her 90 days or 30 or 60 days was up. And from there, she would have a number of jobs from police dispatcher to lunch lady, but she never really stayed at any of these jobs too long. And to me, it seems like she was trying to find her foot and she was trying to find something that she could stay at long term that she liked well enough to stay at long term and that would provide her with a good stable income. And she would actually end up finding this job at the post office. But this wasn't a job at the station because I'm not sure if y'all know, but the post office has stations, which is the place that people go to send their mail, 
pick up their mail, where the delivery drivers pick up the mail to take it out. And then there is a plant, the mail processing plant, where the mail comes in, the mail is processed, and then it is sent off to the different stations after it's separated during the processing phase. And this is where Jennifer started to work. She was an overnight letter sorter at a plant in Goleta, California. And while she was working at the post office in Goleta, she ended up buying herself a condo that was in Santa Barbara. And I don't know, I think Santa Barbara is really close to Goleta or Goleta is a small suburb of Santa Barbara. I don't really know, but she bought a condo in Santa Barbara nonetheless. And unlike all of her other jobs, it seems like Jennifer actually liked this job at the post office because she would stay here for the next six years. And according to all of her co-workers, she was described as the same social loner. She would come in, she would say her hellos, her how you doings, how's the family, yada 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 and then pretty much just going about her business and work quietly while not necessarily fraternizing or talking to the other co-workers around her and when her shift was over she would just go home and mind her business there she didn't really too much engage with her neighbors at home either however there was a neighbor who she shared a wall with so it wasn't hard for this neighbor whose name was beverly graham to hear what was going on in jennifer's apartment so when jennifer would play her music loud it would irritate Beverly and I don't know if they had words or exchanged words prior to but Beverly would end up calling the police and making a noise complaint on Jennifer because of the music and I think this only happened one time because when the police came and confronted Jennifer about her loud music she turned it down and that was the end of it at least that was the end of it in Beverly's eyes but Jennifer was pissed I mean Jennifer was pissed and when i tell y'all jennifer can hold a grudge y'all just hold on to that little piece of information because jennifer can hold a damn grudge okay but in the meantime we're gonna go back to the post office where jennifer works at and it's around this time where the people who work around her started noticing that jennifer was getting a little strange so jennifer would start to talk to herself and i don't mean talk to herself like how i'm talking to myself right now or how sometimes we think out loud I'm talking about she would be talking to somebody who was next to her that couldn't nobody else see. I ain't gonna say nobody wasn't next to her because she very well could have felt like somebody was indeed next to her, talking to her. But couldn't nobody else see him. And these would be full-blown conversations, even arguments. And like I said, the people who she worked with, they thought it was a little weird. They thought it was strange that she was out here talking to nobody. However, they minded their business because she was still doing her work. Whoever she was talking to was not affecting her ability to process this mail. And that's really the goal at the end of the day was get this mail processed. And because she was still getting her work done, people kind of just chalked it up to she was just, she was, that was just Jennifer. But one day in 2004, Jennifer would be called to the supervisor's office. Now, I don't know what happened or why she had got called to the supervisor's office, but Jennifer wasn't going. She was not here for it. She walked up to the supervisor's office, but she refused to go inside. She started cussing, screaming, fussing, doing all kinds of stuff, wilding out pretty much. So much so that the supervisor had to call the postal police on her. And they ended up escorting her off of the property in handcuffs because she was so irate. And because of the stuff that she was doing and I guess saying, they decided to have her committed and they put her on a 5150 hold. And if y'all don't know what that is, that's pretty much an involuntary hold for someone who is dealing with a mental health issue at the moment. And so they put her on this 5150 hold, they got her evaluated and Jennifer was actually diagnosed with a mental health disorder. However, I do not know what she was diagnosed with, but nonetheless, she did end up being diagnosed with something. However, after the 72 hours was up, Jennifer denied treatment because she said she didn't have no problem. And so since she denied treatment, they couldn't do anything about that. They couldn't hold her past 72 hours. So they had to let her go without treatment because she refused. And because of her diagnosis, her outburst, the whole thing, the post office decided to let Jennifer go. However, they did not fire her. They didn't fire her. What they ended up doing was retiring her due to health issues. So it was pretty much a medical retirement. So she was still going to get money from the post office because when you're retired, you get your pension or whatever you get after you retire, your 401k, 
all of those things she was going to still be receiving, but she just couldn't work at that post office no more because ma'am. So after her medical retirement, Jennifer decided that she was gonna sell the condo that she had in Santa Barbara and move completely out of California. She didn't wanna be there no more. And so she packed up her condo, packed up whatever she could into her, pick, into her pickup truck and started heading east. Now it's believed that she was about to go back to New York and go back to be with her family. And that cannot be confirmed, but that's just what what people think was about to happen. However, her car ended up breaking down in a place called Milan, New Mexico. And instead of getting her car fixed and continuing on east, she was just like, well, hell, my car broke down here, so this is where I'ma stay, I guess. It was God's will, okay? So she ended up settling down in Milan, New Mexico. And Milan is a very slow, quiet type of area, very desolate, if you will. And in 2016, the population was only 3,234 people. And that was in 2016. And Jennifer was here in 2004. But the move from California to New Mexico seemed to be a good one for Jennifer because it seems like her mental health took a turn for the better when she got there. She started mingling again. She wasn't talking to whoever she was talking to prior. Everything just seemed to be falling into place for her. She bought herself a little house. She started mingling with the locals. She became friendly with people. She was really just friendly with everybody. And according to the people in Milan, everything seemed normal when she got there. Everything seemed copacetic. Like I said, her mental health was appeared to be fine. However, about a year after she got to Milan, things started to change. Because about a year after Jennifer made it to Milan, her mental health started to decline once again. And all the people who she was once friendly with, she started to distance herself from. The employees at the village hall where Jennifer would go to pay her bills started to notice that she didn't want to talk to them anymore. There was only one employee inside of the village hall that Jennifer would now communicate with. And it started off kind of slow. First, she would look for this particular employee and if she wasn't there, Jennifer would still accept help from the other employees around. However, at some point, Jennifer has stopped accepting help from anybody else except for this one employee. And one day, Jennifer actually came into the village hall with a haircut. And when I say a haircut, I don't mean like she went to the barbershop, you know, she got a little snip snip, so I'm real cute. I don't, I'm not talking about that. It was very much giving Cynthia. Like she just took the scissors to her head herself, didn't care which way she cut, left, right, up, down, how long one piece was versus the other. It just looked very self-inflicted. And along with this self-inflicted haircut, Jennifer will once again start talking to that imaginary friend that she had back at the post office. And again, people thought this was kind of strange, but they minded their business because she was minding hers. And I guess she had a lot to get off her chest because Jennifer would end up applying for a small business license so that she could publish a press. I don't, I feel like it's not called a press. It gives me um, New York Times vibes. It's a, a, a very small, newspaper magazine type of thing. And this particular press, Jennifer would call the racist press. And I know what it sounds like, but the racist press wasn't about what it sounds like it was about. It was pretty much a jambalaya of Jennifer's thoughts. So whatever she was thinking about that week or that month or however often this um, racist press came out, that's what it was about. She had conspiracies about the government. She talked about David Berkowitz. She talked about the post office. She talked about the fact that David Berkowitz worked at the post office. It was really just a compilation of whatever Jennifer was thinking at the time. It was really just a mess. And things would only get worse from here because Jennifer decided that she needed to own a firearm. And so she went down to a local pawn shop where she would purchase a firearm, however, in New Mexico, you got that little 15 day wait period, I guess, to see if you really want this gun. I don't know if it's to do a background check, to do a mental health check, couldn't have been a mental health check. But Jennifer ended up waiting that 15 days. And then when she went to go pick up the gun from the pawn shop, she ended up buying 200 rounds of ammunition. And as we know, the type of video that this is, we all know that this ain't good. This is not good at all. So it's late January 2006 now and Jennifer has been out of California for about two years at this point. And Jennifer decides that she's done with New Mexico. She don't want to be there no more. She wants to go back to California. And so that's exactly what she does. She packs up whatever she can pack up in her pickup truck and heads back west. 
and she decides to go back to Santa Barbara. Now, I don't know how long she was in Santa Barbara before the events of today's case takes place, but I know that the events of today's case takes place on January 30th, 2006. So, on January 30th, 2006, Jennifer is back in Santa Barbara, California. And remember when I told y'all she could hold a grudge? Well, yes, she decides that she wants to exact revenge on her neighbor, her former neighbor, Beverly Graham. And so she takes this firearm that she has now acquired from this New Mexico pawn shop and she somehow gains entry into Beverly Graham's home and she shoots her. Now, I don't know how many times or where on the body Beverly was shot, but I do know that she would not survive her injuries. And I don't know if nobody else heard the gunshots or if nobody else was home, but yeah, the police wouldn't find out about Beverly's murder until hours later. So after Jennifer murdered Beverly, she decided to head on over to the post office that she used to work at. So it's around 9 p.m. now, and Jennifer is pulling up to the post office. And this is around like shift change time. And she did this on purpose because, you know, she knows what time shift change is. She knows when people are going to be going in and out of the gate. Because at post office plants, there are certain security measures that are in place. And one of them is an access gate that you need a badge to be able to enter. And so she knew that somebody was going to be entering or exiting at around nine o'clock. So she waits behind a car who is going into the facility. They scan their badge. The gate opens, they go through, and then Jennifer goes through right behind them. So that is how she makes entry into the employee parking lot. And once she gets inside this employee parking lot, she parks next to somebody who she sees is either leaving the facility or getting ready to go into the facility. And she holds this person at gunpoint and requests that they give her their badge. And this person obliges, they listen to what she says, they give her their badge, and then she tells them to go on about their way, and, and they do so. Now she has this badge so that she can gain access into the actual building. But before she goes into the building, she actually sees two employees in the parking lot. First, she encounters 37-year-old Z Fairchild, who she shoots in the head and is killed immediately. Next, she encounters 28-year-old Malika Higgins, who was also shot and killed on Jennifer's way to the entrance of the building. Once she gets to the actual entrance of the building, she encounters another employee, and this employee's name is Nicola Grant, and they two are shot and killed and this is now three people dead before Jennifer even enters the building so now she uses this badge that she has stole from old boy back in the parking lot to actually gain access into the building but mind you the people who are actually inside working have no idea what's going on because not only is this a very large facility but there are machines running so Jennifer essentially enters the building unnoticed and once she actually gets inside, she encounters a 44-year-old supervisor named Charlotte Colton. And she does shoot Charlotte. However, Charlotte doesn't die immediately. And it's also at this point when Charlotte is shot that other employees start to realize that there's a loud noise that's happening right now that is not these machines. However, they didn't associate it with gunshots just yet. Because inside of the plant, there's pallets. There's a lot of pallets. And sometimes when a pallet is dropped on the floor, it makes this loud bang sound. So one of the employees actually thought that this is what was happening, that a pallet was being dropped on the floor. However, another employee recognized that sound as gunshots. And when the person who thought a pallet had dropped looked up, they saw the other employee grab a female employee pretty much throw her to the side and yell, run. And it was at this point where it was announced that somebody was shooting. And so panic pretty much ensues at this point. And as this is going on further inside of the facility, Charlotte is still laying in the hallway, severely wounded. And one of her employees actually sees her and tries to drag her towards the entrance and ends up leaving her in the foyer area. I'm not sure why they left her there, but 
she was left in the foyer area where she would be later found by the paramedics and rushed to the hospital. But for now, Jennifer is still on a rampage inside. And as she's walking to her old workstation, she encounters a woman by the name of Lupe Schwartz, who is 52 years old. And she sees that Jennifer's coming and she knows that Jennifer is the one who is shooting. And so she tries to run away from the gunfire but unfortunately she's unable to run away fast enough and unfortunately she is shot and killed and Jennifer just continues on. Now I told y'all that people had started panicking and running every which way but unfortunately a man named Dexter Shannon was not one of those people because I told y'all this is a big place. Panic can be happening on one side. People can be yelling, screaming, and doing all kinds on one side of the building. And then on the other side of the building, people are completely oblivious. It wouldn't be unreasonable to think that he just didn't hear or see nothing. And unfortunately, because of this, Jennifer was able to shoot and kill Dexter as well. And I'm not sure what it was that stopped her at this point, but Dexter will end up being Jennifer's last victim outside of herself because she did end up turning the gun on herself and exiting this world voluntarily. So obviously the police had already been called. So they are rushing to the scene. They have now found three deceased victims outside in the parking lot area and at the entrance of the building. And they make entry and they see that Charlotte is still alive and they rush her to the hospital. Unfortunately, Charlotte does die at the hospital. But for now, police are focused on capturing this shooter. And they ended up having to go into the building blind. And when I say that, I mean, they don't know what the hell is going on because they don't know where the shooter is and they are trained to follow the sound of gunshots. But when they enter the building, all they hear is machines running. Because throughout this whole ordeal, wasn't nobody thinking about turning off none of these machines? Didn't nobody care about the machines they were trying to get to safety so the machines are still running there's still people crying and panicking and running they're like there's so much going on right now they don't know which way to go but they do end up coming across Jennifer and she still has the gun clutch in her hand so they do know that that is their shooter and they know they figure out that this is a mass murder so once they finish up this scene and they pretty much ready to call it a night Actually, as a matter of fact, some of the detectives are already at home getting ready for bed. And another call comes in from a man who's saying that he just found his girlfriend on her condo floor deceased. And as y'all know, the woman that he found was Beverly Graham. And it don't take them long to figure out that Jennifer was the one who committed this murder as well. In total, Jennifer claimed the lives of seven people, including herself. And for the life of me, I will never understand why people do this. If you are ready to exit this world voluntarily, don't take other people with you. This was not their choice. This was your choice. This is something that you wanted to do. You was done with this earth, not them. They probably had so much more life left in them. I will never understand why people choose to take other people prior to taking themselves. Like, start with you. I mean, it's obvious that Jennifer was going through some things in her own personal life and in her own mind, and she was probably suffering because of it. But yeah, y'all, let me know if y'all have heard of this case, because like I said, I'm surprised that I had never heard of it because of the rarity of it. Most mass shooters are generally male. This one was a female, and it happened in Goleta, California, which is a very low crime area. And I'm talking one homicide in 14 years type of place and so for this to have happened in a place like Galita and by a woman nonetheless I'm very very surprised that this is not more widespread than it is or maybe it is once again maybe I'm just left in the dark but this was my first time hearing about it but yeah y'all let me know what y'all think don't forget to like comment and subscribe if you like this type of content and I will see you all in the next one I really feel like I should back the fuck up to her parents no yep yeah. To her parents, Jeanette and Frank Mark, nope. But she appeared to be his target audience now. And it's in Blythe where she was able to get a job as a security officer at, um. And from this job, she will have a number of other jobs. Is that right? A number of other jobs. A number of other jobs, is that right? And from this job, she will hold a number of other jobs. No, oh my gosh, that don't sound right. She was an overnight and overnight. And I know that sound, do that sound crazy? Probably not. But one day in 2004, 
Oh, cause I was about to say 2014, honey. And they had to escort, and they ended up, and they ended up escorting her, ugh. And they ended up escorting her off the, ugh. But she decides that for whatever reason, she want to go, nah, not for whatever reason, girl, you know the reason. You be doing too much, bitch, in real life. 